My guest today is Milvio Di Bartolomeo. By day, Milvio is a delivery office manager in the Queensland public sector in Australia. His role involves providing assurance, benefits, governance and risk management advice for portfolio programs and projects. But by night and at weekends, he's a prolific student, commentator and writer on strategy execution and all things to do with program project management. Milvio is the first person in the world to simultaneously become a Strategy Implementation Institute professional, a registered Better Business Cases practitioner and a Managing Benefits practitioner, both of which he can deliver at trainer level. He's written and published over 24 articles and holds several academic and professional certifications. Milvio's combined his experience and knowledge by implementing the Managing Benefits staged funding release by gated review technique in order to protect public sector investment, and as part of that exercise he redesigned the project governance structure to minimise senior management time commitment, truly a man of all methods. Welcome to this episode of Implementing Best Practice in Business. We are here to help you and your organisation understand and implement global best practice to help you face the business challenges of today. Join me, Richard Farrow, CEO of APMG International, in talking to leaders and practitioners who have applied these frameworks and practices to boost their productivity. They're here, willing to share their knowledge and experience to help you learn from them so you can do the same to make you more competitive in today's market. Welcome, Milvio. Congratulations on being this uh, first person in the world, you know, this unique individual to gain all these qualifications. But why did you do it? What was your motivation to, to bring those together? Thank you, Richard, for the introduction. I had uh, probably a number of motivators. Fundamentally, I see learning as a lifelong journey that doesn't necessarily end at the school gates. As I personally fund a lot of my professional development, I tend to be selective in seeking those courses that give me the best value for money. My interest in strategy and strategy implementation initially came from undertaking the Better Business Cases um, course and learning about the five case model, and particularly the strategic case and the need to make a compelling case for change. And then managing benefits, on the other hand, was a revelation as it introduced me um, to the principle of um, aligning benefits with strategy and the concept of clear line of sight. The other driver for undertaking the strategy implementation professional course was the intrigue of learning something new to the market. I'd noticed it being advertised on LinkedIn, so I, I remembered a quote from Eric Lee, the author of Lean Startup, who says, the only way to uh, win is to learn faster than anyone else. <laughs> With the Economic World Forum publishing changing skill sets, um, this has never been truer than it is today. It's interesting you say that because there was another quote I read the other day that said something like, that business trend that's actually, um, the business trend coming through the world is actually supporting your competitors as well as yourself. So there's always this need about how do you stay in front. But, yeah. This um this lifelong learning that you have has also meant that you're an avid blogger, and you know, I read your stuff quite frequently. You know, where you find the time to do it, I'm not too sure, but I actually think that one of the problems we haven't been very successful in delivering projects and programs over the last thirty to forty to fifty years is that the project sponsors aren't actively engaged in what's happening. You know, a lot of it is assumed that it's the project manager, the team that are supposed to get on with it. And often the, spot, the project sponsor abdicates their responsibility, in my view. Would you agree with that? Or do you work with some great, I know you must work with some great project sponsors, and I wouldn't like you to suggest for one moment that the project sponsors you're engaged with aren't, uh, aren't competent to what they're doing. But do you think there is a lack of understanding or lack of engagement by the sponsors, whether it's at a strategy level, whether it's at a program level, portfolio level or project level? So for me, organisations shouldn't underestimate the importance of the project sponsor to lead and drive project delivery um, towards optimising benefits realisation from the investment. But from 
my involvement in government, uh, in governance um, in particular, I've noticed that people tend to, organizations tend to select project sponsors from the organizational hierarchy. But what I've actually found mm -hmm. is um, the best people actually volunteer. They've got skin in the game. They need to be committed to making sure that the, the project is a, is a success. I know the um, Standish Group lists 10 factors of success with um, executive sponsorship being the single most contributing factor. I'm not sure if you come across this book, but there's probably one of the best book titles I've ever come across. It's called The Project Rots from the Head by Colin D. Ellis. What the book actually does is that it tackles the vital subject of um, effective project sponsorship and helps people understand what the responsibilities um, of a project sponsor really are and how they should uh, and how they can ensure their projects deliver the results that the organization needs. Now, I, ha I haven't come across that. I have come across the fish rots from the head, which is a take on corporate governance and the need clearly for the board to to get it right, otherwise the organization. So it's a similar theme. But <clears throat> with business cases, and certainly with all your work in the public sector, you know, one of the things that the public sector needs to consider is what's called the public good. So if you include the public good into a business case for the public sector, how do you then deal with things like sustainability or the environmental agenda when you're considering project viability? Is it possible to include metrics around public goods, sustainability, environmental issues when you're creating a business case for a public sector uh, project? I think it should be included as part of, I use better business cases for me, it would be part of the strategic case. And if I take into consideration the um, social return on investment, it'd be in terms of the expected public outcomes, services and trust around what that spending proposal is trying to do, particularly in terms of yeah, sustainability and, and, and also as part of the economic case, considering that yeah, social return on investment is looking at yeah, the value for money that the, the public is going to receive from undertaking that investment. But is it is it easy to quantify these things or are these one of these things that you know you can only start with a a broad objective that clearly then has to be refined as you go forward? Um I don't believe so. I, I think it it takes a bit of time up front. But I think we could do it from having some leading indicators and and taking into account what Stephen Jenner advises in managing benefits. The spending proposals should be benefits led rather than activity driven. So really, it's around defining what we're trying to achieve from the investment and how to track progress once funding is provided. What I uh, what I found is. Typically, organizations use lagging indicators, things that you're unable to change. It's, it's a given in terms of performance, whereas very few actually focus on the leading indicators to, in, yeah, to suggest how progress is actually occurring against the objectives of the, um, of the spending proposal. Milvio, you say that you think you can do it up front. So when you set up a project, when you come to develop the business case for one of these projects with a lot of um, social good in it, environmental, what I would consider to be fairly um, important but, but soft issues, how do you get people to come up with really good, compelling benefit statement? Do you have to involve a wider range of people? Do you need a collective group? How do you get to that benefit statement that, that someone who wasn't present at the meeting can understand and really appreciate what you're driving at, what you're trying to achieve within that project? Well, part of the managing benefits process is around identifying and quantifying the benefits for the initiative. And part of that process should be facilitated by a um, benefits manager or a benefits management SME who can actually facilitate process in identifying benefits for the um, the project and, and part of that workshop the benefits identification workshop is having the, the key stakeholder who contribute to towards the um, the initiative it's 
more around that's the best practice to approach it. Right. Have you ever have you ever tried to develop a a project and get benefit statements where the group in the room haven't been able to do it? You know, people have really struggled to define any meaningful benefit from the endeavour that they're planning. Yeah, I have seen that. I think it comes down to the facilitator and understanding what the business problem is. And that's part of the problem in terms of realising the benefits from the investment that we sometimes don't understand the problem that we're trying to resolve. And I know there's various techniques that can actually help in defining what the business problem is prior to identifying what potential solutions might be. I know the investment logic map is one technique that does that quite successfully. It's easier, it's easy to understand, particularly those who are unfamiliar with the benefits management. Moving on, there, there seems to be a lot of interest at the moment around the use of data from previous projects that can then be used to plan and assess risks in current projects, come up with more realistic estimates and forecasts. You know, what impact do you think this will have on project managers and project management offices, sort of in the medium term? And do you think in the next couple of years, you know, PMOs will be staffed by data analysts rather than necessarily people from a project background. So do you think data analytics is now becoming a key element within what's necessary to get that uh, that key focus on benefits, benefits realisation, strategy, and that whole linkage? Yeah, I do see a lot of interest in the use of data. I see it more from a reference class forecasting perspective. And yes, there is a lot of information to be mined from the available data that all organisations have. In terms of the impact on project managers and PMO, I actually see those data analysts as an interim step. For, for me, I envisage probably in the next few years that, particularly in the use of the project portfolio management tools, there'll be a move towards artificial intelligence. So it will use that data to provide insight into not just the data that's there, the data that is missing. So it'll be able to inform the various portfolio program and project boards of the information that they should be aware of and it'll also inform around the things that they should be investigating further, particularly the information that's missing or improving the data quality of um, information. But do you see a link to historic records as part of that that planning process? Do you think people will open up their their data banks so other people can see how long something actually took, how much something actually cost, and therefore improve forecasting? I think that will all depend on which sector, and I think their privacy will and confidentiality of that data um, will need to be overcome. I know I've I've spoken around data trust as part of my optimism bias white paper. And part of that, I've noticed that, yes, that will be a consideration moving forward. I mean, I I do think that whole trust and confidentiality piece is, is an important one. But what we're really talking about is things that aren't really that confidential, are they? They shouldn't be. If we thought we were going to take initial estimate of, say, 12 months for a project, and actually it was done in 18 months, to share that after the project's complete isn't a major problem. It just allows people to focus on the outcome rather than the expected. Correct. And that should improve everybody. I, th- I think it comes down to the organisational culture, um, mm-hmm. whether there is a culture of blame. Otherwise, I don't, I don't tend to see that there would be a problem in mining that data, particularly if things are identified. So if, if things are organised by initiative type, yep, you'll be able to analyse those initiatives that have been delivered on time, in budget, delivered the um, the benefits, whatever whatever measures are used or need to be investigated. I don't see that as a problem. I think it's more around the perception and the organisational culture to move beyond the initial hurdle of uh, looking at past data to see actual what what the organisation outperformed. Hmm, very interesting. Milvio, with all your 
experience in research and looking at these things, if someone was just starting their project management career today, what three pieces of advice would you give them? Bearing in mind, you know, we haven't been particularly successful in delivering projects over the last several years, many years. And you clearly have a passion to try to change that for people to be able to deliver things more effectively into the future. So what would your advice be to this person just starting out on a career in project management? Um, I'd like to approach this question on, on in two parts. The first, if, if, if you're someone outside of the project portfolio management industry, then for me, I would advise them to see what transferable skills that they can provide, trying to be open to experience or yeah, opportunities that might that may arise. The other advice I would give them is there's so much information available online. People can, even with very small budgets, can take, for example, Praxis Framework. It's community-driven. It's publicly available online. The only thing that people would actually need is the, the time commitment to actually read and, and study around what project program and portfolio management is. For those who are already in the industry but would like to improve using my own experience i found that i I started um, with project management and then moved myself up in learning around the program and portfolio management and then the specializations of strategy implementation and so forth in hindsight though i would have started off um, focusing on portfolio management simply because it gives you a much broader oversight around what portfolio management is, but it also gives you insight into program and project management. And I think there's no better framework um, to do that than the um, Praxis framework. It gives you a complete overview around what those three layers are all about. Milio, thanks very much. You mentioned Praxis framework there sort of several times. Is this something that you think is the future or is it just another approach along alongside many other bodies of knowledge? Um, while there are many portfolio program and project management methodologies and standards available, only Praxis integrates the three levels. Only Praxis is community driven um, and publicly available, which sets it apart from its competitors, if I can put it in that perspective. As I undertake and fund most of my professional development. I see that as a competitive advantage. It's definitely something that people should consider when they start their careers in, in project management. It provides a all-encompassing framework that, that covers the three, the three main areas. It, it, it's much broader than anything that's on the market and people can actively participate in its um, improvement. As somebody who has studied an awful lot of these things and actually funded your own your own way through taking these courses and qualifications, you see some huge benefit in having that consolidated piece of learning in one product. Milvio, it's great talking to you. Thanks so much for spending the time to, to have this conversation. Please look out for Milvio's next white paper, which is uh, coming shortly, and his focus is on managing benefits. It's an area that few of us do well, and I'm sure we'll all get some huge learning points from his extensive research. And good luck in the next generation of white papers and your <laughs> continuing research into, um, into the world of program project management, strategy and benefits. Thank you very much. Thank you, Richard. Thank you for listening. We're always keen to hear your feedback and suggestions for future episodes. You can find all the information in the show notes below. Please visit apmg-international.com to find out more about our accredited training and the certifications that support them that are related to the topics discussed in this series. I hope you've enjoyed today and I look forward to you joining future episodes while we continue our exploration into best practice and the benefits it brings to global business. Thank you.